Today is all about the Super Bowl, but I want to assure you that Super Bowl is not the word. There's a better word out there. Super Bowls will come and go, but there's a better word. And as I said last week, we Christians like to interview people and poll people and ask people questions. And Super Bowl time is no different. This graph explains that of 100,000 people that are interviewed, 55% of them are going to be praying over the game today. That is more than the 20-something percent that pray over baseball games. So people like to pray about football games. 22% of those who are going to be watching the game say that God is going to determine the outcome. Therefore, why even play the game? 48% say that God is going to reward individual team members who believe in Him. And 33% believe that if they pray hard enough, their team will win. On the other side, 31% of those interviewed believe that God can curse a team, either baseball or football or hockey. And that only through a good behavior of fans will that curse be removed. 21% have a ritual that they do. There are actually people who believe that if they do not wear their special jersey, their team will not win. If they do not wear a Seahawks hat, then the Denver, Denver Broncos are going to win. Uh, what I find interesting in all this is a lot of people are willing to take time to pray over a football game. And I wonder if they would put that much energy into praying for the unsaved in the neighborhood, if there would be a little difference. Because even though it is a great sporting event and a bunch of money will change hands, and it is a fun thing to watch, Super Bowls are not eternal. Super Bowls are a fleeting bit of entertainment. There have been 47, 42, I don't know, what is this, 48? Uh, there's been a little over 40 of them, not quite 50 of them. Uh, four, and there's very few people on this earth who could name the teams that were in all of them and who won all of them. Uh, but yet, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The stories I learned as a boy in church are still true today. I can talk about them because God's history does not change. Today we're going to look at the Gospel of John. It is going to start a year-long, maybe longer series on the Gospel of John. We have four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is the fourth Gospel. I don't know why it's the fourth one, probably because he was last, I don't know. But for some reason, he's the fourth one, and we're going to look at that one. Now, who is John? John was a disciple and apostle of Jesus Christ, and he was one of the inner circle. We know he was one of the inner circle because when Jesus was transfigured, he took Peter, James, and John up to the mountain. The other nine stayed at the base of the mountain. So he trusted Peter, James, and John bit more than the others uh, when they're sitting at the Last Supper. John was sitting right next to Jesus in the place of honor. John also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation. Uh, so there are themes. There are themes of light and darkness, for example, that is in the Gospel of John that is also in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He died of old age and wasn't martyred. Legend has it that he was the only apostle that wasn't martyred. The Romans captured him once, forced him to drink poison. He passed out. When they left the room, he recovered and ran away. Uh, he moved to the hills above Jerusalem. And uh, everybody uh, of your early writers say that he was the only one of the twelve who died of old age. Uh, somewhere in his 90s and was not... Uh, martyred by the Romans or by Nero, who was able to escape. And he wrote what is called a unique gospel that is different than the others. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels because they are a synopsis, a summary of Jesus' life. 
The Gospel of John has things in a different order. It has things in it that the others do not have, and it leaves some things out. And that is because the Gospel of John is more of a tract. It is more of a book that was sent out so that people who read it would know who Jesus Christ is and less of a history book. So what does John leave out? He leaves out the birth narrative. We read the first 18 verses of John. There is no manger. There is no shepherds. There is no wise men. It is in the beginning it was the Word, and that's how it starts. John doesn't tell us about Jesus' baptism, even though we know Jesus was baptized. It just isn't in this book. The Lord's Supper is not in the book of John. The Ascension is not in the book of John, although we know he ascended. And the one that is really surprising is John leaves out all the parables. There's no teaching in parables from Jesus. There are long, long lectures and discourses, but no parables, no little teaching moments with his disciples. So what does he include that the others are missing? He includes the talk with Nicodemus. That's John 3. Out of that we get John 3.16. If there was no Nicodemus, there would be no John 3.16. And that only exists in John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not have for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Very famous and known only in John. Talk with the woman of Samaria. Upper room discourses. John spends more time in the upper room than the other Gospels, and Jesus is teaching during that time, and you have the very famous high priestly prayer, John 17, when John and the disciples are moving to the Garden of Gethsemane, in which Jesus prays that we would be united as he and the Father are united. A uh, very famous, very profound prayer. Uh, John is a spiritual gospel. While Matthew, Mark, and Luke trace the history of Jesus, John tracks Jesus' spiritual impact on the world. Uh, John is very interested in uh, the spiritual response to Jesus Christ. And we know that because John's Gospel finishes with this phrase, now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So what John did is he looked at the life of Jesus, and he picked out those things that God inspired him to choose that prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is why when someone wants to know about Jesus Christ, we give them the Gospel of John, the most popular tract in the whole world, is summaries of the book of John. Uh, millions of those are sold from tract companies all, all the time. You can get little pocket versions of the Gospel of John that you can carry around. They only cost 50 cents in the Bible bookstore, and it's the Gospel of John and how to get saved, and you can pass those out. It's a very profound track inspired by none other than God Almighty. And so we can actually use the Bible, surprisingly, to tell people about Jesus Christ. So John starts, as I said, unlike any other Gospel, and it starts with, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. Now John's Gospel, as the rest of the New Testament, was written in Greek. And so the phrase, in the beginning was the Word, was actually penned originally in Greek. Now there's a book called the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew and about 2000 B.C., 200 B.C., 200 B.C., 70 rabbis get together, and because Alexander the Great had come through the world and taught everybody how to speak Greek, they thought it would be a good idea to have a Greek Old Testament. And so these 70 guys 
translated it. And it's called the Septuagint, which is the Latin word for 70. Huh? Pretty clever. If you were to get the Septuagint and look at Genesis 1-1 and the words in the beginning and open John in Greek 1-1 in the beginning, it's the exact same phrase, the exact same words. And you go, huh, isn't that clever? But Jews who read this would immediately recognize that he was transposing the Old Testament in the beginning to the New Testament in the beginning. And instead of God created the heavens and the earth, John says in the beginning was the Word. The word, word, universally recognized and understood. The Hebrews, for example, were very cautious about misusing the name of God. One of the Ten Commandments is do not take the Lord's name in vain. They meant, they felt that meant treating it with disrespect. And if you wrote it on a piece of paper, God's name, Yahweh, that would be disrespectful. So instead of writing the name of God, they would write the Lord or Adonai or Elohim. And when they talked about the personification of God, they would transpose human features for the word. So Hebrews were very much into the Word of God, and they understood when John wrote, in the beginning was the Word. What they would hear in their mind is that in the beginning was the Word of God. An example of how they did this is Isaiah 48, 13. You can look this up in your Bible. Our English Bible says, My hand laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand forth together. Now, we know God doesn't have hands and God doesn't have a right hand. And this concerned the Jews. And so when they translated it, they wrote, My word laid the foundation of the earth, and my word spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand forth together. So you get a Jewish Bible, and whenever it says hand, right hand, things like that, they would substitute my word out of respect. What does this mean? This means when Jews read, in the beginning was the Word, what they saw in their mind was in the beginning was the Word of God. In the, min in the beginning was God's activity of how He did things. God spoke, let there be light, and there was light. They knew their book of Genesis, and that's what they saw this as, the Word of God, the active purpose of God. Greeks, however, would also read this, since it was written in Greek. And they had the word that was being used as logos. Logos is the Greek word for word. And so, John would write, in the beginning was the logos. Now, Greeks were very mystical, very superstitious. And they said that this logos thing was God's active agent on earth, that God's breath, God's speaking, God's word, was how things happen on earth. A philosopher by the name of Heraclitus uh, said that it was the source of all reason and rational thought. So when Greeks saw him write, in the beginning was the Word, they were saying the Word is the brains behind the universe. Logos is ultimate reality. They would write, trying to figure out what the world is all about. And so John using this word, Word, wasn't just a random flip coin and pick a word. He's using a word that was universally recognized and understood by every culture and by every philosophical system. To the Jews that he wanted to reach as brothers and to the Greeks who were 
lost as lost could be back then. Now, John doesn't rely on Greek philosophy or Hebrew mysticism, but uses the word to get their attention. He uses a word out of their philosophy so that they will read on to verse 2 so he can get their attention. We can use things to get people's attention, but the philosophy of the Greeks is not what he is all about. John continues in verse 1 saying, And the Word was with God. Everybody, Jew and Greek alike, understood that if you're with God, you're holy, pure, righteous, and that you existed before the world began. Is that if you are with God, you are something special. If you are with God, you are in there. And that if you are with God and you say something, you need to be listened to. Because anybody who is... God doesn't keep his enemies that close. God doesn't keep unrighteous people that close. But then with hardly taking a break, breath, what John says is the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That blows away all Greek philosophy and the Hebrew religion. We don't know who this word is until we get down to verse 17. That's why I have 1 through 18 read. We're not going to get that far today. But it isn't until verse 17 that John says, and this is Jesus Christ. And so take verse 17 and put it way back to the beginning. In the beginning was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was with God. And Jesus Christ was God. Jesus Christ is God. And that can be confusing for some people. What this means is that Jesus Christ is with, but separated from God the Father. And Jesus is the same essence as God the Father. The system that this is is not fully understandable by humans. We call it the Trinity. You have in your bulletin a Trinity cheat sheet. It looks like that. You can keep that in your Bible. And if anybody says it's going to be the Trinity, this is as close as we can get. This actually was published in 1901, and it's been uh, accepted ever since. Uh, Son is God, Father is God, Spirit is God, but Father is not Spirit, Father is not Son, Son is not Spirit. They are same being, different persons, different jobs, different economies even. God the Father is the Creator, God the Son is the Savior, and God the Spirit lives inside of each person who accepts Him. We look at this and we say, but then what do we call ourselves? What do we believe? Well, we are Christians. We elevate Christ above all because He died for us. Uh, there are some people, uh, the Jewish people of today, we would actually call theists because they elevate God the Father above all. Uh, we are followers of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ said it, we do it. We are New Testament people. We are people of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we worship and serve Jesus Christ who was and is God in the flesh. One commentary said that Jesus Christ is the only member of the Godhead that we can see. Uh, the Jews would call uh, the managerial God the Godhead. Uh, we can pray to God. And in theory, we're praying to God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit. It's okay. We can just say, Dear God, this, I believe in God. And that works just fine because it's one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the member of the Trinity that John is uh, interested in is Jesus Christ. And we are also interested in Jesus Christ. And it's because of Jesus Christ uh, that we celebrate communion.